Hello and welcome to the NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. This week, we have a very special guest, a man who's just retired as Supreme Court Justice, Justice Kurian Joseph. He retired on the 29th of November as the third most senior judge in the Supreme Court, a part of the Collegium, and also, of course, a part of many landmark judgments, including of the National Judicial Accountability Commission and the Triple Talaq verdict. Justice Joseph, thank you very much for joining me on the NDTV Dialogues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, in a career which, as I pointed out, had so many landmark judgments, what for you has stood out as the highlight of the highest judiciary, uh, inextricable pillar of our democracy for you, which you had the honor to be part of? See, I came to Supreme Court um, 2013, March 8th, uh, probably the Women's Day. <laughs> I have rendered, uh, um, I, in fact, I've disposed of uh, 8,700 cases. Mm -hmm. Every single case I handled, I felt it has a capacity to change the world of the person who I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you ask me a general question, I handled every case with the same importance. And if you ask me certain landmark judgments, which uh, of course we wanted a deeper uh, look at it, like you said uh, about the National Judicial Appointment Commission, the core block allocation, triple talaq, and so on and so forth. I also enjoyed that decision which I authored, mm -hmm. especially exclusively authored, that is with regard to the, uh, the, the constitutional status of corporate institutions, where I set like the um, local uh, institution, lo lo what you call panjaits and municipal corporate, municipalities and municipal corporations. Mm -hmm. There can be no confidence in corporate institutions as well. Mm -hmm. Sir, the point you said really of the Supreme Court as an upholder of the Constitution, as an upholder of constitutional morality, ethics, what also struck uh, the world, I would think, is when in a landmark moment, in an unprecedented moment, you and your brother judges came out and spoke about your concerns. Today you have said that you came and spoke because you felt that the then Chief Justice of uh, India, Deepak Mishra, there was a feeling that he was being remote controlled. What did you mean by the remote control? See, the existence of judiciary should be independent. If it is not independent, and if it is dependent, then the independence of judiciary, which is the hallmark of uh, Indian judiciary, is gone. Mm -hmm. Its credibility is shaken. So we found that uh, there had been external influences uh, on the Chief Justice of India, and not on the person that uh, the Chief Justice of India has not been taking independent decision. Not only me, uh, many of the brother judges and uh, four of us since we were part of the Collegium, we discussed and we, were, we brought it to the notice of the then Chief Justice of India mm -hmm. as the things are not uh, going in the right direction. You should uh, correct your ways. We met him. We brought his uh, notice in writing. And then finally without uh, uh, without finding any result, as I often used to say, the barking dog has to, had to bite. Mm -hmm. Who did you feel? And we, and we, we went to the press, there's an initial reason also. To me, both the judiciary and the media are both the watchdogs. Mm -hmm. I used to ask a question to the media friends also, what were you doing? Mm -hmm. You also had a duty to watch and protect and preserve the, the, uh, the, the purity and independence of the judiciary. And that way protect the democracy as well. What were you doing? So in a way, we were not only talk, bringing to the matter to the notice of the nation, but we are also telling you that you better do your duty as well. Exactly. So when other institutions failed, the Supreme Court and you, your four judges stood up to protect the institution, not the individual. You're saying that to the protect the institution. But who... 100%. 100%. It was the institution. Who did you feel was controlling the remote? Who was holding the remote control? Who are these external influences? I had no idea as to who, or we had no idea as to who were the persons. But we were quite sure that uh, he was not taking, that the chief justice was not taking decisions uh, independently. So do you think it was, he had a influence of the government? Was there political influence? Was there, what other influence would there be higher than the Chief Justice of India? Um, I'm, I'm not able to pinpoint as to who was influencing him, mm -hmm. but we can, we were quite sure that he was under some influence. 
what was the evidence or what were the decisions that you felt that led you all to this belief? What was uh, what struck you as evidence or what struck you as odd? And you felt that these decisions are not in line with the order of natural justice. It's not a question of uh, one decision or two decisions. Exactly. But generally, <coughs> in the uh, discharge of his functions as Chief Justice of India and uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India, we found things were not going in the right direction. It was, in, it was one instance that was pointed out in the press conference itself was uh, regarding allocation of cases. And we had also brought uh, so many other things also which were there in the letter we wrote to him. So the Judge Loya case, because that really became the issue of controversy. Do you think it was the Judge Loya case which was the final uh, straw on the camel's back which made you speak out the allocation? No, as was disclosed in the press conference itself for one among the uh, four of us, that was the issue on that day. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that that was the only issue we were uh, um, disturbed with, no. Which were the other cases that you were disturbed with? Not cases, issues. Or which were the other issues that you were disturbed with? There are several with? issues in the matter of allocation of cases, in the matter of governance of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. That's all. Because uh, for even after that, the issue came about master of the roster. And those cases are heard directly by the Chief Justice of India himself. And that was question two. Do you think that was appropriate that the Chief Justice of India should, in a sense, the institution decide whether the institution should be master of the roster? Well, it would have been more appropriate if you ask me a personal question. My personal view is that in a, question, in, in, in a situation as to the decision he has to take, it would have been more appropriate had the Chief Justice of India uh, recused from uh, hearing that case. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, sir, that then perhaps the Judge Loya case, because of course the verdict on that has been given by Supreme Court Judge Bench, but do you feel the Judge Loya case should have been investigated further today? No, that chapter is closed by the Supreme Court, so it should not be proper for me now to uh, discuss anything on that, because there was a threadbare uh, hearing on the issue, mm -hmm. and unless it comes judicially, then it would not be proper for me to discuss on that. Mm -hmm. Many issues came up, and after you had that press conference, in a sense, uh, all hell broke loose because you, four of you were targeted. There was speculation whether the person next in line to be Chief Justice of India, Justice Gogoi, would become Chief Justice or not. Would, he, uh, would Justice Mishra not recommend him? And what the impact would be on the careers of each of you? Did you ever consider that when you decided to break your silence? Not at all. For me, left to me, I always believe that uh, the valiant shall never taste death but once. Mm -hmm. I had that prophetic courage and all of us. Mm -hmm. We were unmindful of what is going to happen to us, but we were really concerned about what is going to happen to the nation. Mm -hmm. Do you think things actually changed in the Supreme Court for the better after your press conference? There have been changes, qualitative changes, at that time also and now also. Are you satisfied? Do you think currently the people of India should be satisfied with the situation in the Supreme Court today? No, things, things are still to improve. Hopefully, I, I believe things will still improve. Mm -hmm. Did you face any government pressure after you spoke out? I had no pressure. Uh, certainly people were not quite happy uh, the way we came out, mm -hmm. but uh, that didn't uh, affect uh, me in their any, any, any personal relationship. Mm -hmm. In fact, interestingly, uh, not just the government, but many senior jurists also expressed their dissatisfaction with the fact that uh, the four uh, Supreme Court judges spoke out. Fali Nariman, who of course is one of the most eminent um, uh, legal uh, lawyers we have today, also said that this actually brought down the sanctity of the Supreme Court that should have been sorted out within yourselves. How would you respond to him? People are entitled to have their own views, number one. Number two, I'm quite sure that uh, all those who spoke uh, in those lines were not quite aware as to what all steps we had taken uh, to prevent such uh, uh, unpleasant uh, step. It mm -hmm. Certainly it was an unpleasant step, unprecedented step. Uh, in the normal sense, it shouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But why it happened uh, is known only to us who were part of the decision. In fact, interestingly, the whole issue of a government uh, judiciary relationship has been in focus in the case you heard as well, even in the issue of the National Judicial Appointments Commission. And at that point, you had, uh, of course, been part of the judgment which said that uh, the judiciary must be supreme in appointment of judges, but also. You said the current system of the collegium must really be changed, that there must be glasnost and perestroika in that. How do, you, how do you actually manage both keeping government out and making sure that the current system is fixed? See, that is as far as the working of the collegium system is concerned. See, as you know, the glasnost and perestroika are the two concepts. You should have an open approach and you should have uh, corrective steps. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure thereafter, 
since it was taken to unto ourselves. Mm -hmm. There have been better discussion and uh, uh, better interaction mm -hmm. and better verification of the data. This is the improvements which I notice uh, personally. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, one thing is yet to come, that is the secretariat. Unless we have a secretariat uh, functioning in the Supreme Court and in the High Court in the matter of um, selection and appointment of uh, judges, mm -hmm. it will not be possible and practical for uh, the, sit the people sitting in Delhi to know about the credentials of uh, the various other judges in the across the country mm -hmm. and people who are to be taken to Supreme Court also. That is one thing which is still lacking and uh, should be done and that is a very need of the hour according to me. In fact, appointment of judges is so politically vo volatile. We all remember, of course, in the emergency when Justice Khanna was passed over after he gave an adverse judgment. Many felt that Justice Ranjan Gogoi would also be passed over. Did you think that would happen? I never thought it would happen because people at the helm of affairs had the objectivity mm -hmm. to see what was the reason that we came out and that it was we all stood for the betterment of the institution. Mm -hmm. There's nothing personal about it. Because, of course, uh, later one issue that di uh, did become controversial was the appointment of another Justice Joseph, and that, of course, was uh, uh, the Chief Justice of Uttarakhand High Court, who had given a verdict against the current government in the issue of uh, dissolution of the Assembly and pre uh, President's rule. And then this inexplicable delay when one person who had been nominated was promoted and he wasn't. Do you think politics was part of the reason? I would like to make a, a side comment on that. I'm not Justice Joseph. I'm Justice Korean Joseph. Yes. Joseph is actually my father's name. But every time you call me Joseph, I'm happy because my father gets the glory. But All right. So Justice Korean Joseph, yeah. yes. Whereas the other, my brother is actually Joseph. He's simple Joseph. Mm -hmm. And I'm Korean Joseph. My mm -hmm. first name is Korean. My Joseph is my father's name. Leave it aside. Mm -hmm. See, in the matter of uh, appointment of Justice Kaim Joseph, uh, I was also thoroughly unhappy with the way the government was delaying it. Not because it is Kaim Joseph, it is, it is with anybody also from which state also, but once the collegium makes a recommendation for appointment, government can't sit over it. If they are, they are not happy with it, they should send, them back, the, send back the file mm -hmm. and uh, ask the Supreme Court to take a call on that. That was not done. Mm -hmm. They were sitting over it. That was why I felt uh, quite unhappy about it. I do not know whether it is on account of the decision he rendered, but the same was the decision the Supreme Court also rendered. Mm -hmm. The decision was challenged the Supreme Court. The same ditto was the decision by the Apex Court as well. Mm -hmm. So I do not think that whether it was the decision, but what reasons weighed with the government, I do not know. But do you feel that often when there's a delay, delay like that, that a fear is created in the minds perhaps of judges that what happens next depends on the kind of judgments you give. Do you think there was that kind of perception? 100%. This is where I am afraid that uh, the executive is going to interfere with the independence of judiciary. So look at the situation in the, a list comes from the High Court, mm -hmm. where the High Court has uh, arrayed uh, them in terms of their uh, date of um, uh, becoming an advocate. This is the method that we follow now. Mm -hmm. And in the normal turn, if that seniority is uh, respected, uh, he is like, in all likelihood, he is, like, he is, um, uh, he is to become the Chief Justice of that state because uh, it is simply in the matter of uh, the, the first one in the uh, High Court consent. Mm -hmm. And there also, thereafter also, he can, his likelihood of uh, coming to the Supreme Court as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that graph can be changed if that person name is withheld and others are cleared. And that has been happening. Mm -hmm. This is where I felt unhappy and again wrote that the independence is at peril. Do some cesarean section now. This is what I said. Mm -hmm. And has that changed the practice in high courts? Because we've seen that happen in certain cases, which has been related uh, to the current state government. We saw it happen in Karnataka recently. In other cases, uh, the current governments. Do you think this is happening? And how how uh, are we going to improve this? Yeah, unfortunately, it has been happening. I've been asking the Chief Justice of India mm -hmm. that uh, once uh, these matters uh, come to your notice, please don't uh, permit this. Mm -hmm. To me, I feel that it's high time that a principle is laid down as to how to regulate the seniority in the matter of appointment of judges. Now it is based on the date of uh, taking oath. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you really want to prevent this mischief, there should be another uh, uh, what you call uh, regulation in the MOP that uh, the seniority will depend on the date on which and the, the order in which the collegian concerned recommends the name. And a time frame for response from the government as well. This time frame is actually there, but uh, is hardly followed. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. A larger issue that has been raised uh, by uh, by some groups also has been the issue about 
who will judge the judges? Looking at the issue of whether there is corruption in the higher judiciary, even the thought of it is something which once it creates a doubt becomes an issue. And there was the issue of the medical admissions case which came up uh, at a time when you were on the Supreme Court as well. Is this something that concerns a senior judge like yourself, a judge in the collegium, when you hear charges or questions being raised about our Supreme Court judges clean or our Supreme Court judges corrupt? See, people have a right to raise questions and they would be justified in case uh, they are sure on the facts. Mm -hmm. I no doubt of they should raise. Mm -hmm and it is uh, for the barking dogs to take further steps if the judges are corrupt. Mm -hmm. But to me, I refuse to believe that any judge in the higher judiciary is corrupt. Mm -hmm. He should not be corrupt. Mm -hmm. And he is corrupt, then the watchdogs should take appropriate steps. Mm -hmm. And of course, this, uh, this whole question of corruption can take many forms and the question of whether and I don't think, sir, you'll be offered any post-government jobs now after you have spoken out like this. But no, this I had made myself clear that I will not be accepting yes. any post-retirement post assignment, assignment as well. But of course, we know that many of your predecessors have taken, whether it's a job of, of a governor or whether it's other jobs. Is that a kind of, not, I wouldn't use the word corruption, but is that also a kind of a, perhaps a sweetener? which is done for judges who perhaps are in a particular way as opposed to judges who speak out in a different way. Yeah, it would all depend on the decision that the, one, the person takes. Mm -hmm. So you don't, think that, you don't think it is really an issue to worry about? You don't think there should be a... It is an issue to worry about so long as uh, uh, the, 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 the stand of the government is that uh, how you look forward will depend on how you please us. Mm -hmm. If that is the stand of the government, it worries me. But isn't it implicit when one judge will get a governor's posting or ex-judge will get some other posting? Isn't that kind of implicit? It's not implicit in the sense that the person who is taken to such posts mm -hmm. has such a credibility mm -hmm. and such a stature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's a good point. Just to ask, sir, really looking at the Supreme Court as an upholder, as we said, of the Constitution, but also now the increasingly the tightrope walk between issues of faith and the Constitution. For instance, the triple talaq verdict. Now, there were some who felt that uh, this was an issue of uh, faith, of personal faith. The Supreme Court shouldn't be interfering in it. Others who felt that this is an issue of equality as laid down in our Constitution. Can you tell us a little bit more about your views on that? See, our Constitution is a beautiful text. It's a holy book, according to me. It contains all uh, moral principles of all religions mm -hmm. taken to them. Look at the very uh, preamble, justice, equality, liberty, fraternity. Do the religions uh, don't uh, speak out these values as well? Yes, there. But with all that, in the preamble also says it's a secular, secular country. But the beauty of the Indian secularism is that it's not ours to any religion. Rather, it welcomes our religion. It has a space, the constitution or the nation has a space for any religion. Mm -hmm. And also people without religion as well. That's the freedom of conscience. I have a right to not to believe in any religion at all. But once you believe in a religion, that only three safeguards are given. Subject to uh, public order, health, morality and other parts of the uh, constitution, deal, uh, um, provisions of the constitution dealing with the fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. Any person can believe in any religion practice that religion and propagate that religion also. It's not simply believing. He can uh, propagate that religion as well without uh, any interference from anybody. Mm -hmm. That's the freedom. Well, that, the, the, that freedom is subject to this public uh, order, health, morality and the fundamental rights. When the fundamental rights are violated or when some practice goes against the public order, health or morality, then it is for the the legislature concerned or the parliament to step in and uh, make appropriate uh, laws. Mm -hmm. See, why do you make a law? Law is made for two purposes. One, either to prevent a disorder or to provide an order. So, had the legislature been legislature concerned or the parliament been vigilant on certain practices being unconstitutional or unethical or immoral or um, against uh, unhealthy, maybe uh, as unhal unhealthy, mm -hmm. then it's for the lawmakers to make appropriate law. Only, make a, only because the lawmakers don't do their job, then the matter comes to the Supreme Court. 
So, interestingly, sir, because uh, the other uh, the other principle being applied then after the triple talaq verdict is on Shabri Mala. And you're from Kerala, so you know, of course, again, the iconic uh, place that this issue holds in the, uh, Kerala. But we've seen there politicians from across parties coming together to say the Supreme Court verdict is wrong, except, of course, the state government. Here we're seeing the court being attacked. We're seeing the principle that even lawmakers are saying we will break a law laid down by the Supreme Court. How do you think the issues, of, when it comes to issues of religion, faith and the law, how do you balance that tight work? Madam, since uh, Sabarimala is an issue now pending before the Supreme Court, it will not be proper on my part uh, to comment on it and I will not come make any comments on that. But if you ask... Uh, a as question, a larger issue, yes. As a larger issue on principle. Well, so long as there are... Uh, the, 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 the So long as the Lexpran Drega as such is uh, given in Article 25, mm -hmm. neither the people nor the court nor the... Uh, lawmaker shall cross the election there. Is there already there? Mm -hmm. Because interestingly, of course, sir, the other controversial issue which the court is facing now is the Yodhya hearings. Because again, the politicians are attacking the Supreme Court, saying the court doesn't understand the majority sentiment, the court doesn't understand X and Y. So, we an ordinance should be issued, a law should be issued. Is this, do you think, in that sense, the whole relationship also between the executive and the judiciary has become? slightly strained when issues like this are brought to the court's door, then there's a uh, political outcry against this. How do you react to that? Again, madam, this uh, Ayodhya is a pending issue. Mm -hmm. It will not be proper for me to come. I will not comment on it. But if you ask me on a principle, mm -hmm. see, why do people come to the court? People come to the court because there are no proper legislation in place. Mm -hmm. So the first thing the legislature or the government should introspect is that why the, on issues, uh, people come to court, should they not make uh, appropriate law? Sometimes they feel it convenient not to make law and leave it to the court. It's an unpleasant task. That is not uh, a Like Section 377? Many such issues. Many such issues. Because uh, people who decide law are people who are appointed. Not to make law, but to interpret law. And they may not uh, represent the diversity the country uh, otherwise uh, is represented in a law making process mm -hmm. and they may not have the wherewithal also mm -hmm. to know what is the public interest. There is a lot of interest between public interest and what the public is interested in. Yes. Unfortunately now it is not the public interest but the, what the public is interested in mm -hmm. is the issue now being handled. But can the Supreme Court, do you think, how can the Supreme Court decide on matters of faith? You laid down the four principles, but do you think it is becoming an increasingly complex issue that when you now have to look at issues of faith, uh, communities which has such a major impact, as you said, which perhaps then has to be handled by people who are voted for. The Supreme Court judge uh, bench is not accountable to those people, but the politicians are. So how does the Supreme Court actually deal with matters of faith which are so personal? Supreme Court should bear in mind that while dealing with the such issues, the safeguards and the Lakshman Drega that is provided under Article 25, that's, that's mm -hmm. the end of it. Mm -hmm. Once they do their duty within the uh, limits of the constitutional obligations, constitutional duties or constitutional uh, rights they have in interpreting, mm -hmm. there's no problem. Do you think the, uh, the Supreme Court perhaps, and this has uh, often been raised by for, uh, law ministers as well and former law ministers from cases like coal block allocations or other issues, that why, is, why are we seeing an activist Supreme Court? That perhaps the Supreme Court is interfering in matters which is not strictly within their domain? question is very simple. When you have a passivist government, you have an activist court. When you have a passive, in the sense, uh, no, people who are not making law, if the government has... Where, why, why, why do, where do the court come in? When there is, if there is good governance and good governance, there is no room for court at all. The, uh, what do you call the, the um, overseeing by the court is only as to whether the governance is in accordance with the constitution. Mm -hmm. If there is good governance in terms of the constitution, the court cannot. The court always keep on saying that we will not interfere with the policy matters because if those policy is in accordance with the constitution, there is no room for the court and court shall not interfere with uh, the policy decisions which are taken in accordance with the constitution. Mm -hmm. So it is for the, the executive to implement the laws in terms of the constitution and it is for the legislature concerned the parliament mm -hmm. to make laws in terms of the constitution. So in the uh, absence of proper uh, legislation in place and in the absence of uh, good governance in terms of the legislations already made, mm -hmm. the court uh, has been asked by the public 
to in terms of public interest mm -hmm. not in terms of the what the public is interested in mm -hmm. the courts are not to fall into that trap as to what the public is interested in that's a different uh, realm altogether that's not for the court court shall go only into the public interest in terms of the 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 the, the, the mandate in the constitution because being the watchdog and the upholder of the constitution as you rightly said the court has a duty to uphold the constitution and its values you made an interesting point also now about activist and passive government we have a very activist government now and so but the court is still as active as ever the active and passive i meant pass the the active in making the laws in respect of the issues mm -hmm. which concern people right it is in that sense in fact an important uh, point sir where the, the government suddenly became very active also was in the issue of njac it's come up in previous governments as well and again and that and your verdict and uh, again i quoted fali nariman who said that really is a verdict which has safeguarded the independence of the judiciary why do you think that issue was again a crucial one in upholding the integrity the independence of the judiciary and why and do you think the government will keep trying various ways in a sense to get some more control over that government is trying In no working. doubt about it. I told you, you know, so once you send, when, once you make a recommendation, and the government selectively uh, uh, clear the names and hold back names, it's an interruption. Justice Lauda, the Chief Justice said, it's a direct attack on the independence of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So that way, there's an interference. So government is certainly not happy mm -hmm. the way the Supreme Court has held that uh, the independence of the judiciary should be preserved in the matter of appointments as well. Mm -hmm. you made also sir an interesting point on, on the issue of uh, secularism and you've also said that you know that uh, the one thing is that i don't want to be seen as a as a judge as a minority judge in the sense that a judge from a minority community in the sense of this whole current uh, discourse we hear about majority versus minority do you think the issue of what religion you're from also becomes a factor even in the judiciary in appointments and do you see that as a, something which is happening now has been happening for ages it in principle it should not be but real life is often very distant that's what i said in principle that should not be a criterion at all mm -hmm. in a matter of appointment of uh, judges see it's not a question of which i always made an stand that it should be on the basis of merit mm -hmm. but uh, given the diversity of the country if the merit alone is uh, seen mm -hmm. then you may not have a representation from a region you may not have a representation from the the diverse uh, um, uh, cultures minorities languages hundreds of uh, diversities there so the, the backward classes scheduled caste and scheduled tribe women all these are you know the sectors which uh, the country should take into consideration mm -hmm. because we constitute a nation with all this mm -hmm. so after giving due consideration to the merit and if you are not getting this uh, diversity is reflected in the selection mm -hmm. then you may have to go a step further uh, uh, to see whether uh, this diversity is also can be reflected without call, uh, sacrificing the quality because that was an argument the government used against uh, judge k m joseph saying making that point that you know that their states are not represented there's other castes which are not represented so the collegium didn't buy that argument it was there before the collegium as well but merit uh, came uh, there as well because other according to the collegium other diversities uh, uh, were represented uh, therefore uh, once uh, the merit uh, uh, comes above all these aspects then mm -hmm. the collegium took a conscious decision on that mm -hmm. did you ever find that it because you were from a particular religion or minority did you ever face any discrimination because of that i don't want people to see me as a person representing a minority in sitting in a judiciary mm -hmm. see you take a uh, oath a judge takes a oath you know without fear or favor affection or ill will mm -hmm. to uphold the constitution and the laws and i have taken an oath in the name of god mm -hmm. that faith is my own personal uh, belief but i don't want to be seen as a person representing a minority in the, uh, the in the in the in the supreme court or in the court whichever whichever court mm -hmm. and i never ever displayed any such uh, things in my whole career as uh, 18 years plus in the judiciary mm -hmm. as a high court judge as a chief justice and a judge in the supreme court of course and uh, and wherever people had the slightest of uh, uh, chance of uh, suspecting my uh, allegiance or my faith or worship that way to any person related i have ordered such cases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because i felt more than the decision that it should be seen that justice is done i have recused from such cases 
that is the, that is the uh, the the way we are brought up yes, as judges. You know, once is not a person coming to the, the judgeship uh, doesn't know that he is aware of it. He is aware of uh, the realities in the country, he is aware of his onerous duties and he is aware of his duty to uphold the constitution beyond all. Of because course. your duty is to uphold the constitution and the laws, mm -hmm. not your faith. Mm -hmm. And of course, so many times in any kind of chink you'll find that uh, politicians try. And in fact, interestingly also, sir, the first impeachment motion against the Chief Justice, and again, people often took that as a fallout of the press conference and said, oh, did, did uh, you all open the door to an attack by the political class when if an impeachment motion came up? Do you think something like that brings down the issue of the dignity that when politicians try to bring impeachment motions or do? Does the court itself need to be more awake of its responsibility to uh, make sure that everything is above board? 100%. It is for the court to uh, make sure that things are above board. Once we do our duty properly, there's no room for others to get into and uh, seek uh, this sort of uh, unpleasant jobs. You don't think the impeachment motion was a sad moment for the judiciary? It, it, to me, it was a sad moment for the judiciary. All those unpleasant things. Even the press conference we did was a sad moment in the judiciary. Even that uh, uh, decision which we took to send uh, one of our brothers mm -hmm. uh, to, to jail was a sad moment. It's a painful moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But all these are done from our side since we were left without any other uh, yes. uh, alternative. Do you think future Chief Justices won't be remote controlled or can't be remote controlled? I, I cannot rule out that possibility because uh, governments will always try mm -hmm. to somehow influence the chief justices uh, because uh, they are they are not happy at all the way the independence of judiciary has been taken over as the sole proprietary concern of the judiciary itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as you, well, the current Chief Justice is one of those who spoke out. So in this case, you're satisfied there's going to be no remote, remote control, I'm sure, sir, since he was part of your four. I, I believe that he will, because he's, he's part of uh, the crusade that we took up. So the, he should, certainly. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, sir, just before you retired, also were your thoughts or your remarks on the death penalty. Could you outline to us why exactly you made a such strong statement? Why you think the death penalty needs to be reviewed in our law books as part of our st uh, st constitutional statutes today? It is not uh, Justice Korean Joseph's personal view. Mm -hmm. It is the view that has been expressed from 1980 the constitution within in Bachchan Singh. Mm -hmm. There have been several cases mm -hmm. down the uh, history of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court also requested the Law Commission of India mm -hmm. to look into as to whether this needs to be written in the statute book. And it's the Law Commission of India which submitted its report in, uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. saying that it is high time that we, we reviewed this uh, death penalty as a punishment and uh, taken away from the statute book. Mm -hmm. So what has been echoed by the Supreme Court in the various decisions over 35, 30, uh, 38 years, yes, mm -hmm. now, which I reflected in the judgment. No, and it, and it is an important point of reflection, especially when you look at the number of uh, scheduled castes and the number of people, the death penalty, the kind, the class the people be used again is definitely um, uh, much of an issue of reflection, but... Uh, you said it right. You just go through the report of the Law Commission. Yes. You'll find the type Start of people facts. who have been sent to gallows. Mm -hmm. Finally, sir, uh, your thoughts now in uh, post-retirement, you said that you didn't want to take any government uh, government job, any government post in that sense. Why, why was that? Why did you think that you don't want to take any government post in a sense? Two reasons. One, it was always seen by the government that it is their charity, <laughs> which I don't want. After being uh, held my um, uh, head high all these years, I don't want to be uh, on the mercy of the government in getting an appointment, mm -hmm. going to them with a the begging bowl. Number one. Number two, I thought in, in the, uh, with the experience I have, I can do better service to the people mm -hmm. in my own way without us uh, taking up any assignment mm -hmm. and do some service in the field of um, mediation. I'm a passionate uh, uh, person in the matter of mediation, mm -hmm. mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and mix up all this uh, into mediated arbitration or a, a conciliated uh, mediation, mm -hmm. all this. These are the two reasons why I took a conscious decision not to take up an assignment. Mm -hmm. You talk so often, sir, in this interview also of the issue of secularism and the Constitution. Do you think the Constitution, uh, secularism, which of course came as part of an amendment in the Constitution, do you think it is, in, uh, do you think it is uh, safe? Do you think it is being upheld? What do you think of the state 
of uh, affairs of the nation that you see today? See, there should not be any discussion on this issue of secularism because the constitution has uh, made it secular in the constitution that secularism is one of the fundamental or, uh, or basic, we call it as basic structure of the constitution of India. So, without that, if you mean a basic structure, see, if secular is a basic structure, if the basic structure is removed or shaken, it shakes the nation, mm -hmm. nation falls. So, therefore, there is no question for any discussion on secularism because India is a secular country and uh, the beauty of the Indian secularism is that it is not averse to any religion mm -hmm. and it is not pro to any particular religion. All religions are treated equally and any person, any citizen in this country has uh, freedom to believe in religion, not to believe in religion and if he believes, he can believe his, uh, in his religion, he can practice his religion, he can proclaim his religion, he can propagate his religion. So, that space is given in the constitution. That's, therefore, there is no need for any discussion because that space is held by the courts as the basic structure of the constitution. So, there shall be no shaking to the basic structure. But do you think it's under threat in any way, sir, today? I do not think and uh, I am inclined not to think so. Mm -hmm. Well, those are very reassuring words to hear from a judge who as today as ever has his head held high. Justice Kurian Joseph, thank you so much for being on the NDTV Dialogues. It was wonderful to interview you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.